Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it'll turn a lot of heads? Well, join us Saturday, February 24th at Jake's Bait and Tackle for the second annual kayak show and seminar. Starting at 11 a.m. will be the kayak show. The four categories this year are the DIY division, a kayak that costs less than a thousand bucks, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak, and the best in show. You will have a ton of kayaks there to be able to show off. If you want to ever get into kayak fishing, this is the time to go look at so many cool rigs and setups. We will also have a ton of seminars with a bunch of great guests. The first one, starting at noon, will be Mike Ortega of Northern Virginia Kayak Association. At 1 p.m., we'll have Sela Johnson. At 2 p.m., we'll have Jake Harshman. At 3 p.m., we'll have Matt Campbell. And rounding it up at 4 p.m., we'll have Joshua Evans. The overall seminar will be going from 11 a.m. to about 4 to 5 p.m. will be the whole event. If you would like to sign up your kayak, you can me email me, fishingindmv at gmail.com. Again, if you'd like to sign up your kayak to have a chance to win a ton of cool prizes, email me, fishingindmv at gmail.com. And we will see you Saturday, February 24th at 11 a.m. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Hello, guys. Welcome back to Richmond Expo Day 2 Electric Boogaloo. Uh, this is our second in-booth uh, conversation of the day. We are also going to be going to booth to booth to hit whatever we have uh, actually left off. If there's someone that you really want to see, please let me know in the episode description, Instagram, Facebook, email, text, smoke signals, I don't care. Um, as you guys know, with Fishing in DMV, it's not just about the bass fishing. That's the, that's the niche that I know and I have friends in, so it's very easy for me to actually start there and, and branch out. And every year I try to add more to it. Uh, last year it was really adding to all the rivers and lakes that are in the systems. But I want to branch out and do more cat fishing, striper fishing. I had Will Nash on talking about striper fishing at Kerr, which I think is really freaking cool. And I wanted to get crappie on, but I didn't know where to start. And then as you know, way leads on to way, Aaron, who we just had on, really got me in contact with these these two beautiful people here, um, Josh and Jeff. Thank you guys so much for coming on. I mean, just tell the crowd like what you guys do and just how this all got started for you. Sure, sure. Yeah, my name is Josh Morris. Uh, I run the Richmond Crappy Club. I started it back in 2020. Um, I grew up with a third of an acre pond in the backyard, and so I'd fish there all the time. Then we'd float down the James River in a canoe. We'd usually do that once or twice a summer, and um, started doing that. Then I went off to college and kind of got away from fishing a little bit. Then when I got back, finished college, started work, a buddy and I would fish after work. And then from there, we mm. uh, started seeing these pictures on Facebook of people catching, you know, a cooler full of one pound crappy and i grew up catching half a pound crappy Dang. so i'm thinking okay i need to start learning how to fish these public waters and my thought was if i go to tournaments if i find a tournament i can learn a lot and I, my 40 dollar donation or whatever it may be that's well worth the investment on figuring out okay where to fish how to fish what to do mm -hmm. and to meet people you know network and uh, learn the techniques so i started doing that then uh, i just got hooked and then i uh, fished for a couple years live scope came out and that changed the game got live scope and you know, I've had that for now, uh, I don't know, about five years. And so just branched off from there, started the Richmond Crappy Club, uh, went down to Bugs Island, started fishing the uh, Bobcats Crappy Series. And uh, then I got Jeff over here. Uh, I think I converted him from a uh, bass fisherman over to the crappy side. Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I started, came up same, just like Josh, fishing country <laughs> pond, you know, in the country and went into smallmouth fishing when I was younger, 18, 19 years old, did that for 25 or so years, um, ended up, uh, trying some largemouth fishing out, went to Chesden and fished there some. And um, my son saw that Richmond Crappy Club was coming to have a tournament there. So I said, let's try it. So we tried it and um, pretty much started fishing them. The next year we did the whole season with them. Um, got to be better friends with Josh. Um, and then one December morning, he decided to take me out and show me the live scope. And it's been nothing but crappy fishing since then. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And now fishing and with the Bobcats, we've done, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Southeast Crappy Alliance uh, Trail last year and did fairly well with that. Um, and had a lot of fun and just really enjoy using the forward facing sonar to catch crappy. So, Josh, when did you decide I wanted to be a masochist and actually run a tournament organization? Because that is stressful as hell. Like, it, how did that it is. Um, I'll tell you, it's it's a lot less work. To just show up at somebody else's tournament, yeah. fish tournament last weekend, and uh, showing up there, especially going down to Bobcats, just being you a can enjoy it, and relax. Yeah, a little. oh, this is relaxing. <laughs> don't have to worry about everything else. Well, um, I knew I wanted to get better at crappy fishing, and so I knew I wanted to fish more bodies of water. And when you're in a tournament setting, you fish different than if you're just out fun fishing. You know, when you're fun fishing, it's 
if I don't catch him, I don't care. In the tournament, you're pushing 100% the whole time if you want to be competitive. Um, so I fished uh, my buddy Ryan Smith. He has a crappy trail called the Peanut City Crappy Trail down in Suffolk. They're a bunch of small lakes, 9.9 uh, .9 horsepower lakes. Fish those, and I uh, said, so, you know, the, the Richmond area could really benefit from having a crappy series. You know, going as far north as Lake Anna and, as, you know, as far south as uh, we do. We've had our classic on Bugs Island one year and down on Lake Gaston one year. Um, so we just fish five tournaments, five bodies of water, and um, it's been a lot of fun. And each year it's grown. You know, the first year I, I just had a bunch of tournaments. So let's see how who's interested and where this goes. And we averaged four and a half boats per tournament. It was either four or five boats every tournament. And then last year we averaged 14. Wow. So so it's growing. I think this year there's a chance we may average over 20 boats per tournament. And the people that get into it, it's awesome just to see the transformation they have from – we really advertise the folks that – that have never crappy fished before, want to get into it, don't know where to start, don't know what to do. And we share tips and tricks at every way in the top three. I ask them, you don't have to give away your locations and burn your spot, but you know, what did you do? Did you use a slip bobber? Were you spider rigging? Were you fishing docks? Were you fishing brush piles? What were you doing? And uh, we want everybody to catch fish and most tournaments, everybody's catching fish. So. Cultural wise, as a, as a novice in the crappie world and everything that's going on in it, it always came across to me as a Midwest thing. It, or ha has there always been a strong crappie scene in Virginia in this area? Or is it something that's just starting to grow out more? I think it's definitely starting to grow. I think, uh, yeah, I think no, it's, been, no. it's been pretty small. I mean, you look like Mississippi is the hub for crappie yeah, fishing. Okay. Yeah, and a year and a half ago, I went down to the um, the uh, uh, American, no, the uh, Crappy Masters National Championship. And that, I think it was 180 boats in a tournament. I mean, that down there, it's, it's huge. It's it's some of those lakes down there, the crappy fishing is bigger than the bass fishing, you know, and it's wow. in September when the crap are usually a lot smaller. Um, it averaged, I think it was 18 pounds on seven crappy. So Damn. over two and a half pounds Holy a piece. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Massive crappy down there. And I think it's it's slowly starting to work its way, uh, way north. You know, a couple of the lakes like Bugs Island have always been really well known for crappy. And uh, Bobcats has been having that trail for a long time. But I think historically it's been a little bit intimidating when you see these folks that are long lining, trolling eight rods behind a boat or spider rigging, having eight rods in front of the boat. Until now with, with live scope, you just need one rod. You just need live scope, trolling motor, it, you know, and that's pretty much it. One rod, you can get it done. Yeah. And, and for guys in the comment section down below, uh, best question wins a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. So start answering some questions here. Um, this is really cool. We can actually start talking about crappie as well. How do you, for people that don't know, how do crappie tournaments work? Maybe there are guys that just bass fish, they've never done a crappie tournament before. Five fish limit, six fish limit, what's the standard? Is it is it catch and take home? Is it, is it put, like, how does all that work? It, it varies a lot from yeah. tournament to tournament. Um, I'd say Bobcats has pretty much adopted the the standard, the historical standard, which is seven crappie, and they must be alive. If your fish dies, it doesn't count. Yeah. And then on your boat, you can keep more than seven fish. All right, so most of the time when we're in a tournament together, we'll, we'll try to keep eight fish alive just in case one dies, then we have an extra fish. Okay. All right, so that's that's the way we're working. Like Bobcats, you meet at the bait and tackle store in the morning, and then from there they draw numbers on when you can leave the parking lot. You, you start fishing when you get to your spot, and then you fish until 3 o'clock. You stop fishing at 3, and then you have to be back in the weigh-in line by 4 o'clock back at the store. And then you weigh in your seven heaviest fish. Josh is, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, um, is live bait something that's standard in these tournaments or is it just all artificial? Um, most of the time, unless it's specifically stated that it's artificial bait only, uh, most of your crappy tournaments allow live bait. Okay. Um, so you can use minnows or whatever you might have you to use. Um, it's no problem. We have in the Richmond Crappy Club, we've had a tournament or two a year, you know, where it's artificial bait only, one rod, you know, one you can only fish with one rod at a time. And, and just, you know, just to make it interesting and mix things up a little bit. But on the whole, most of your crappy tournaments is just live bait. You use the minnows. And we tip a lot of our jigs with minnows, especially in the colder weather this time of year, um, especially on tournament day, just to, for that added insurance to catch a fish, you know, give them something to taste, give them something to smell. And How much of it is a difference that make now with, with all the technology you have and, and everything you can buy, gulp, sense, and crap? Is still a chunk of dead fish or, or live minnow. Is it really make that? Is it that much of a difference maker sometimes? I feel like it is, but it might just be my what I'm confident it's in your head in. Time yeah, thing. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh, what I'm confident with, like I, having a bait that you're more confident with, or color, because I'm more of a natural color type crappy mm -hmm. fisherman. I typically going to use some white, 
sand colored, something like that. I kind of stay away from the brighter color. It's just my, my preference. Yeah. With, with that being said, I'll, I'll say for tournament fishing for me, I started off crappy fishing just spider rigging before live scope. So always used a minnow. So then when live scope came out, I kept using a minnow. And then I noticed some tournaments you'd have those fish that was short strike. And now when you've got a jig tipped with a minnow and they're short striking, they're just getting the tail of the minnow and you're, you're really not hooking them at all. So I've started now a lot of tournaments. I'll use just a hair jig first and see how they respond to that. And if, if they commit to it, that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to waste time digging in the minnow bucket, putting the minnow on, making sure that the minnow stays alive. I'm not going to worry about all that. But if they're not committing to it and you need to dead stick it, then we'll put a minnow on. So, How do you practice for a tournament when you're talking for crappie? Is it, is it how many spots do you want? How many schools do you want? Are you, and I've seen this, I think uh, Matt Panrack of uh, B-Tail talks about just hunting one fish. What are some of the strategies, basic strategies that you guys use? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll say it was kind of interesting. Um, I started fishing more with different people, and I was fishing with uh, one of Aaron Ball's buddies, Brian Green, and uh, he was surprised when I told him that I'm not just trying to catch a limit. You know, it's not mm. uncommon to go out and be able to catch 50 crappy or 100 crappy, but if you're weighing in seven, you want you want seven. Yeah. You, maybe your goal that day is to catch, catch a dozen or 15. So it depends on your goal, but if it's specifically a tournament, my goal is always to look at the weights of previous years and say, okay, if there's 25 boats and they're paying the top five, what does fifth place have? Gotcha, or do they gotcha, need a pound gotcha. and a half average, a pound and a quarter, a one pound? And it really varies in the time of the year and the body of water that you're on. And then from there, you know, if it's going to take a pound and a half fish, I don't want to catch a fish less than a pound and a quarter unless it gets to that 12 o'clock mark and you're really struggling and maybe we need to drop back and punt. You find the insurance, yeah. So you'll go into the tournament knowing I've got this quality fish here, this quality fish here. Um, and it really depends on time of year because we get into these, this time of the year, we're looking for more of a, a single fish here and there versus like when we get into it in October and stuff like that, I might have five to 10 quality fish yeah. on a piece of structure. Well, now I'm looking for this time of year, most of the time I'm looking for them in open water. They're not on structure. They're not structure related. So they're just kind of around the bait. And uh, for bass snobs, how, how locked jaw can a crappie get compared to a bass? Can they be just as a pain of an ass when, when, they're I, off. I'd say so. I'd say I'd yes, say, most definitely. Well, I mean, I would say 90 to 95% of the fish we're catching in a crappie tournament, we're seeing them on live scope. Yeah. We, we see the crappie. We know exactly what we want to do. We know how to present the bait. And depending on the temperature of the water, how aggressive that fish is going to be, mm -hmm. how you want to put that bait in front of them. And it, it can get very frustrating when, you know, you go to a weigh-in and it's like, I saw a dozen fish. And if I had caught one of those 12 fish, that would have put us into money. But we just couldn't get them to bite. <laughs> get them to bite. Jeez, and you yeah. know, you know, it's like we know that those are the crappy that we need. I just caught one that's a pound and a half, and this one's bigger and it won't bite. How yeah. long do you give them? Do you have it in your head, like a clock of like how long you're going to give a school if it's not cooperating? I feel like, depending on the conditions, when you first approach that fish and have the first drop on it, your best chances of catching that fish are right then. And if if you don't, if they don't commit to it on the first drop, I think your chance is just cut in half. Yeah. Maybe worse. Maybe worse. I mean, it's a lot of times we give them, what, three chances maybe? Yeah, maybe, yeah. And then, you know, it's a certain amount of time, too. If that fish, you know, if you're fishing for your suspended fish and he sees your bait and then he locks on it and he's looking at it and he's looking at it and he's looking at it, at a certain point, you know, we'll try to ease it away from him to entice him to bite it. But at that point, you know, he'll follow and then he's just going to he's gonna pull off. He's not going to commit. Yeah, your chances of catching that fish just drop dramatically. At that point, Sometimes what we'll do is switch up baits on him. And I'll be sitting, you know, behind and say, okay, let's try this bait on, hand him the rod and put that bait in front of the fish, trying to change that bait. And sometimes that'll work to entice that fish to bite, you know, after you've already kind of messed him up a little bit per se. So what now, are, oh, go for it. Go I'll for say it. another thing that plays into it too is how many tournament fish are you seeing in a day? I and mean, we have some tournaments there, it's like every 15 minutes we see a tournament fish. All right. So you got to think I'm big about efficiency. I mean, efficiency, I mean, bass fishing is the same way. You want to put your bait in front of as many tournament fish as possible in that day. You know, so if you find a tournament fish and it's not co cooperating, but you think you can find another tournament fish in 15 minutes, well, don't waste 15 minutes on that fish that would bite, mm -hmm. you know, but if it's taking you an hour, hour and a half, sometimes we only see five tournament fish in a day. If you see one, you may want to give it a little bit more time. How much is live scope affect now, we can, we can talk about the positives too, which I mean, it's opened up crappie fishing, bass fishing in general. 
I've seen with me when I'm when I'm bass fishing, bass are starting to shine away. When you when you hit them with a cancer ray, depending on on how close they are, they will shy away. Are crappie that susceptible to it as well? I don't I don't think it's it's been that way yet. Now it's interesting when we're going out. Like if I go out to like Lake Anna and I'm looking for open water fish, I don't know for sure. But as far as people that are specifically targeting crappie on Lake Anna for open water, I don't think there's that many. Right. I don't think there's many at all. Oh. Now, you go down to Bugs Island, and it's becoming a lot more prevalent. Why? Why do you think that is? I think Bugs Island's just known as a place. I mean, you can catch a three-pound crappie at Bugs Island, and it's not that uncommon. There's several three-pound crappie every year. Lake Anna, you don't, you don't hear about that very often. But they're often. not open water at Lake Anna compared no, to... No, you will. Okay. So it, it depends. It really depends on the time of the year. I've always thought that the warmer the water, the more likely that fish is to be structure oriented, recover oriented. Mm. And then the same thing uh, with the clarity of the water. I think the clearer the water, the more often they stay to that cover or that structure. You go to like Smith Mountain Lake, you'll find them on a brush pile in February. You go down to Bugs Island, it's tough to find a tournament fish on a brush pile in February because they're all in open water. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, tournament fishing at Bugs Island is very frustrating and very rewarding. It's very pattern specific. So you need to know that time of the year, what should the fish be doing? What depth are they going to be? What part of the lake are they going to be? And there's so many different patterns that you sh you can find at any given time, too. So, God, that's freaking interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, I, th I thought it was just bass that gave people headaches on cur. I didn't think about, like, crappie and other kind of game fish like that. It, is it because of all the blueback, the pelagic nature of that lake where fish want to chase versus set up on structure? Is that is that kind of why they're different there, you think? I wonder if it has more to do with the uh, predator fish. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I would think I so. I wonder if with, when the stripers, I mean, stripers and the big bass, it, it seems like when the water's a little bit warmer, they're more active. Mm -hmm. And then I think those, those crappie are on the brush pile to get away from them. Now, it's interesting, too, because it seems like the bigger the crappie, the less skittish they are as far as being <laughs> they feel in a little the cover. safer, yeah. Those, those two-plus-pound crappie aren't scared as, as nearly as much as a half-pound crappie. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and we got we got one question. Or is it? We got. I'm sorry about that, guys. We got Swirl. Pull it up there. We got Swirl. Oh my God! I love some of your usernames, guys. We got Swirl like uh, Swirl like. You just want a gift card to Jake's Main Tackle? Message me on Facebook, Instagram. You can do fishing the DMV at gmail.com. Looking for a starter crappie rod. You got any suggestions? Um, thoughts on a starter crappie rod? Um, I've come to really like the ACC crappie sticks. Um, and it, they have a pretty good variety of whether you want to shoot docks, whether you want a jig and pole, um, whether you want a long pole. The crossover rods, I use that a lot when I'm single poling or pitching. They have a 12 and a 13 foot. Um, I've got mine, they have, they have them here at the show. Dances booth has them here today. They have plenty of them to choose from. Some really, really nice rods. And I think he actually has a dock shooter going down to five and a half foot, I believe. But I've been using those ACC sticks and I've tried four or five of the other vendors for crappy rods, and that's just the one that I, I'm really, really comfortable with. I think I'm up to about five or six of them now that I own, so, yeah. <laughs> Generically, line-wise, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're not using, are you using like 30-pound braid to a 20-pound leader? Like, what is a good starter setup when it comes to your spinning reel and your line? I, I like pretty light line, and it's interesting, too, because you can you can dive into it. If you're just starting out, like same thing with bass fishing, you're just starting out, you may want to get a rod and reel and line, that works for a variety a of jack techniques. of all trades kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. And same thing with bass fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, you start off bass fish, you might want to dial a combo that's 80 bucks or 100 bucks. And if you get into it, you're throwing a jerk bait or a crank bait or, you know, flipping a jig or something, you want something completely specific. And that's kind of how we've gotten to the point. We've got this rod for this technique and this rod for this technique. And it's yeah. all very specific. Now, starting out, I think most people like crappy fishing, they like to cast, cast a jig, a hair jig or a plastic reel it back in, reel it over a brush pile, or shoot a dock. And that's probably the funnest way to catch right. it. That would be a jigging rod. I would go with a jigging rod with that. You know, yeah. Eight, eight, nine foot, seven foot, something like that. Yeah. Yep. Even a dock shooter, five and a half. Yep. I mean, shooting docks is a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 So that's, and then as far as your answer, your question about line, I really like the, uh, the slime line. And it goes back to the technique that you're doing. If you're shooting docks, I like a high vis and okay. you usually like four pound test, usually okay. something really light, maybe six pound. Um, the thing is, the lighter the line, the easier it is to shoot the jig. Oh, um, and you can shoot it significantly further with the light line. Now, I've got a love-hate relationship with four-pound test because <laughs> that's that's the uh, touchy mark between being able to shoot that dig, jig way to the back where that big crappie's probably going to be hiding 
and that crap you're running around one of those dot pilings and breaking you off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, when we start mm. using our long drives, we start using like a 13 foot ACC crossover. Jesus. Yeah. Where yeah. the hell do you fit that in the boat? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, it's funny that my first boat that I was crap fishing out was a 16 foot boat and I had a 16 foot rod. And um, so where they where they started, they hung out the back. Yeah. Um, so you see going down the road and the rod tips are bouncing. Oh God, man. Um, All the money you put in that too. But with those, a lot of times we're using, we'll be using 10 pound line. Mm -hmm. And if we're targeting an individual fish, I don't care if it's high vis. I like that super stretch pretty good because when you're horsing on that that rod and that fish with a 13 foot rod, you think about a five and a half foot rod, the, the distance that you travel setting the hook versus that 13 from here to vertical, there's a lot more stress on that fish. What are the perks of that? And that's something we can really get into the, uh, and then guys, keep the questions going. I'll make sure we'll get them answered by our crew here. Best question wins a gift card. Um, with that longer rod, is it is it basically your Domeki rigging, so to speak, where you're keeping that thing hovered out in front of them? Is that the purpose of having that 13, 14 foot rod? It depends on what you're doing. I mean, like if I'm pulling up on a structure, say in a warm water fish or structure oriented, and I want to pitch over that structure, so I'm actually only using enough line of the same length of the rod. So it's giving me like 23 foot of a pitch to come over top of a structure in front of my boat. And so it's no really, once I hook the fish, I'm pretty much just bringing them around and bringing them into the boat. I'm not reeling them in. I'm not fighting it like that. Um, and that's the idea. So I can do multiple pitches with the same movement and then pitch again and just keep, you know, and I like to keep the bait hovered over top of their heads and see how they react to the bait. Okay, so, yeah. that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. There's a lot of different techniques. You know, with crappy fishing, it's interesting. I'd say we're pretty much always fishing within 25 feet from the from the trolling motor to the fish. And a lot of times it's 15 to 20. Now, when you start getting in clear water, that the game changes. But a lot of the waters that we, we fish are stained or muddy. And so, like just like Jeff said, you'll pitch that bait out. And then with a long rod, you can control the speed that that bait comes past that fish. Because you can lift your rod tip and you can bring it back to you. All right. That makes um, sense. Now, with that being said, too, if you're spider rigging, which is how we, a lot of us started out before live scope, we would have two rod racks. Each rod rack could hold four rods, and you'd have the 16 foot rods. The longer the rod, the further you get the bait wow. from the boat, yeah. and you'd vary your depths. You say, okay, inside I want it to be 16 feet deep, and I might go 14, 12, how 10. How do you feel them on a flagpole? Like, I'm thinking it's pretty thick, or is it pretty thin? Like. Well, it, it depends on the rod too. The rods now, from now to seven years ago when I started crafting fishing, have gotten a lot better. Okay. They're a lot lighter Certainly and they're a lot more sensitive. Hold up, brother. Yeah. So that makes a big difference. Um, it, it's interesting too, just the, the types of rods that you use, the pros and cons to each rod, right? So when you're spider rigging, a lot of times you'll see the, the tip will be very sensitive. The backbone's very strong, but the tip is sensitive. So you're just watching the tip of the rod and if you're truly spidering with that live scope, you want to hide this line where you can see that line move or twitch just to the side, right? Now, with these rods now, I mean, you can feel, I can tell when, if I have a minnow on a hair jig, I can feel when that minnow's gone because they're so sensitive, That's insane. believe it or not. Yeah. Now, with that being said, the more pieces you add onto a rod, you lose sensitivity. That's so most of these long rods are, are, are two pieces that we like to use, right. Okay. right? Once you add that third piece, I think you lose a lot of sensitivity. How, how prevalent is spider rigging now that live scope is such a basis in tournaments? For tournament fishing, there's not many people doing it. No, not at all. Not at all. Now for fun fishing, I'm getting ready to set up some uh, T-bars on my boat just to go out like the James River uh, Christmas Eve a couple of years ago. Uh, my dad and I were out on the James River fishing one of the creeks and I had to pick up the trolling motor because we were, we were spitting up mud and we were catching pound and a half crappy in like two foot of water. And so it's hard to see it on live scope when you're doing that. That's where that spider rigging comes into play. That's a great segue because I think we got, uh, we got, we got Angel, <laughs> Angelia, uh, la, la, la. we got Angie, Angelia. My God, what is with me today? Angela, thank you. I, English is my second language. We got Angela Williams. Uh, do you have to have? Do you have to have live scope in your initial setup in order to fish and or place in the crappie tournament? Because I just butchered uh, uh, English. Please message me on Facebook, Instagram, or you can email me fishingdb at gmail.com, and you can get a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. That's the interesting thing about the live scope in tournaments right now. Because I think just to add to her question. There are some tournament trails that say no live scope, correct, nowadays? It's interesting how it started out. 
Yeah, I mean, because when I started fishing in the Richmond Crafter Club, I didn't have the live scope. Oh, wow. And, I, you know, we won a couple of tournaments without it, but I would say that it is definitely an advantage. Um, and some of your clubs, some of your clubs are going to have a non-live scope bracket and a live scope bracket, you know, so you're only competing against people with or without the live scope. You know, if I don't have it, I'm not competing against guys who do, so they, they, they work it out. But it is definitely a huge advantage when it comes to tournament fishing. With, with, with that being said, um, the national crappy trails, you got a couple different trails. You got American Crappy Trail, you got Crappy Masters, there's National Crappy League. Crappy Masters had a tournament in Florida in January, I think it was last year. And the team that won, it was two guys that, that didn't have, I don't think they had a fish finder on the boat. Uh -huh. The rods they were using were essentially cane poles, yep. and they were dipping lily pads. That's cool. And, and they won the tournament. Now, they had the history on that body of water, and I don't think they could could go to Bugs Island right now and do the same thing. You know, so it, it really depends on the time of the year and how those fish are holding and what they're holding on to, gotcha. um, the advantage that you have. This time of the year, I'll tell you personally, I don't think I could, could compete as well as we've done without live scope. I mean, I, I was crappy fishing a year and a half, two years before I got it. So I was just starting to like really learn the patterns and I got it and I catch myself using it as a crutch too often. I put the trolling motor in the water and start looking rather than thinking, where should these crappie be today? What for people that are trying to get into crappie fishing, but they don't have the scope? I mean, what are some pointers that you could give them? Really, as we get into the late February, March part time of the year. If it was me, I would I would go to spider rigging, like you saw my set at different depths. I would uh, try, you know, on my creek channels, river channels, uh, main lake points. Um, and like you say, you know, try to figure out if you didn't have the live scope, just figure out if you could figure out with a size scan or something like where your bait is or your down scan, what level your bait's at. And I would start hunting just above. If that bait wants to be at 25 feet, I would set my baits down there at 24 feet and start easing around your points and easing around, trying to stay around uh, channel swings and creek channels and river channels. Mm. What are your top three lakes in the area just to catch a crop? It doesn't have to be the biggest citation, but like if you want to take somebody and just get into it, that they can have success. Probably for me, I would say James River, Chickahominy River, Bugs Island. Two titles and a <laughs> lake. Wow, interesting. The, the two rivers have, have a lot of crappy. And, and it's I don't think it's as specific for the time of the year as a lot of the lakes are. On, on these tidal rivers, I think you can go to the same areas and the fish may move a little bit, but if you find them in a particular section of a creek, I think you could catch them there in the summer and you can catch them there in the winter. I don't think they move as much as the as the lake fish. Interesting, oh. interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Have you guys fished the res before, Aquan Reservoir? Aaron Ball keeps trying to talk me into coming uh, up not. there. At some point, I'm going to. McCluskey, I had him on my show. He threw back the state record uh, white crappie by accident. I heard about that. I yeah. mean, it, I saw a picture of that thing. Jesus God, that thing had a mouth on it. And it swallowed like, it was like a mega bass uh, plus one. I mean, it's insane how big that damn thing was. And he took a picture and weighed it and threw it back. And then Odenkirk called him and was like, you're an idiot. That was this new state record. So I'm assuming there's more like that in there. And I'm wondering like, how many small lakes like that haven't been hit by like pro uh, crappie anglers to actually exploit that. Same thing with like largemouth fishermen. They get to get some of these smaller lakes. Yeah, I, I think... Uh electric only lakes have have more big fish that are easier to catch oh, yeah. than elsewhere there's there's a few places not too far from here where it's like i always worry about those places get get burned a little bit because mm -hmm. how many people once you find out about it it's like some of those areas and some of those key spots get get hit pretty hard and that's that's one thing i'll segue into as well that the thing that worries me a little bit with live scope with crappy fishing is crappy have historically been a pan fish you know it's and that's how i started it was like if you catch a crab, you're taking it home, you're cooking it. Yeah. You know, and it and yeah. it's it's interesting with bass fishing. It's like if you post a picture of a on Facebook of a of a bass on you know that you're getting ready to fillet, it's like you'll you'll be cursed. You know, yeah. so yeah. I I'd like to, uh, for me for crappy, I, I really like like a 12 inch crappy is perfect. The, the amount the size of fillet that you get, but I throw back all the crappy that are over 14 inches unless it's like gut hooked and not going to make it. You know, so I hope that others will start to do the same, especially as more people start crappy fishing. Right. Throw those trophies back. You'll catch them again. I've caught the same crappy 
multiple times. It's culture, and this is I've talked about this on the show a bunch with with uh, SAV, where you got people that just think it's a weed, and you got you got to kill it, and you got to change that culture. And what happened with bass fishing when Ray Scott said like we're going to go to you know releasing what we catch, that took fifty plus years maybe to get that to sink in. And if you and now I think we've gone too far to the other end of the spectrum where, like you said, man, you know, you get cursed like the devil if you keep one. And we got to find that middle ground. And I crop you fishing, I feel like can swing the other way a little bit to where, yeah, you got especially with scope, because it's interesting to know how much live scope will affect the population when it's basically catch and take culture. Does that affect the population, do you think, more than like a, a, a species like a bass where they want to put them back? I, I wonder one thing, uh, just a, you were asking about how do the crappy tournaments work. So Richmond Crappy Club, when I started, I know a handful of folks that fish out of a fish out of a kayak or really small John boat or just a trolling motor, 9.9. So I told them, I said, I don't want them to have to worry about keeping a crappy alive. So I said, as long as you're keeping the fish to eat, you can keep whatever you're legally allowed to keep and we'll weigh the fish in dead or alive. All right. And that's just for the Richmond Crappy Club. But now... We're getting more anglers, and anglers are getting a lot better too. Yes, yeah. indeed. And I'm seeing how many fish that are taken and how many are being kept. I may have to revisit that rule in the future just because, you know, I worry if we're going out and people are catching and keeping 30, 40 fish per boat. We have 14, 15, 20 boats. That's taking There's a lot potential. of fish away. Yeah. That's a lot of fish, depending yeah. on the reservoir place you're at too. I mean, that's a big thing. I mean, hunting around reservoir probably won't be able to take the pressure as Kerr probably could, but. Yeah, I've always been fascinated about that. And also when it comes, I mean, that's the one side, and I've talked about this uh, with Benarski of the DWR about regulations with, with put and take, or put and take, with, with fish that you keep. But also the technology side of things. Live scope techniques came from crappie fishing. Scoping techniques came from crappie fishing. Trolling motor brakes, apparently that's the thing now. That's yep. a crappie fishing thing. Um, what are some interesting things that you see that bass fishermen haven't clued into and it doesn't have to be big secrets, but just common sense things that you guys do nowadays. Well, one thing I, I wanted to bring up, if somebody wants to get good with live scope or any forward facing sonar for bass fishing, right now is the time to do it in January and February. And I think crappy fishing is your segue to get into it. I think catching crappy with live scope is a lot easier than catching bass with live scope. Hmm. Right? And, I, and I've tried both and it's just a success rate. And I look at some of these national crappy guys They'll talk about going out, being able to catch a uh, hundred crappie in a day in January, just suspended fish, and they'll go out and try the same thing with bass fish, and they'll catch six or seven. Now, they'll some of the fish that they're catching are really big, but uh, this time of the year, when the water's cold, the crappie aren't moving a whole lot, so it's pretty easy to set up and drop down on them. And once you learn that technique, I mean, I think you can get a lot better. You can segue that into bass fishing and how that that plays into it. Yeah, and I. And the bass seem to slow down as well when it's a little bit colder. They are, that's a hard one to get in front of. I mean, if you're swimming a straight line, it'd be one thing, but you know, they swim all over the yeah. place and chase them. So it's kind of hard to keep up with them with the forward facing sonar. Whereas so he's talking about the crappy, just, you know, when it's real cold, they'll almost just be sitting in the water column, not hardly moving at all. And the bass aren't moving much faster, but they do seem to be a little bit trickier to get in front of. And stripers are even worse. <laughs> they really are moving around a lot. So, um, but I think to start with the crappy, so you get used to seeing your bait and seeing the fish and how, and then the distances, you know, that fish is 60 feet in front of my boat. Well, you know, if you're just getting started with it, you don't know where 60 feet is until you catch it. Oh, well, that was 55 feet. We try again. Oh, that was 50 feet. Now I've hit 62 feet. Now I'm going to get in front of the fish. Well, the whole time that fish is moving. So it really, it's a whole lot of variables involved in trying to get in front of that fish. But um, I think the forward facing sonar is going to be a major player in largemouth fishing too. I mean, it's really coming a long ways here in a little bit of time. So, it's it's interesting too. Uh, I was listening to one of your podcasts when you interviewed uh, Trent down at um, Bugs Island. So this year he's he's dominating Bobcat's crappy trail. I think in the first three tournaments he's what top two or top three yeah. in all three of the tournaments. Yeah, and so it, it sounds like everybody's known him as being like an elite bass angler down there, and then now. He's an elite crappy fisherman down there, you know? And so I think he kind of went went around about it a little bit backwards of learning the bass side of it and then going back saying, well, I can do that, that crappy fishing too. That dude probably has also every stump and rock marked in that damn place too, <laughs> which kind of helps. Probably yeah. so. It's, it's interesting too, with you talk about bugs, how many different patterns you can find. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to spill his beans, but you know, uh, he's doing some of his techniques and some of the tournaments that we've placed in, 
He's doing something completely different than us, completely different water depth, completely different type of rod style. Everything's completely different. When it comes to boat control, I've always thought spot lock and power poles are, are the two technologies that people don't praise enough because it's boat control. You can lock it in. But with forward fate with say sonar, it's kind of gotten rid of spot lock. So many people have to use the trolling motor shaft. Do you think the turrets are a thing that's more of a gimmick or do you think that's going to become more of a mainstay? I, I think it's going to be a main thing. You're talking about the cra like crappy brakes, right? The crappy brakes, the turrets that you can have next to the Ford. So instead of using your uh, your foot pedal to move live scope, you have the turret next to it with a button. So right. both, it's uh, a two-part question, the crappy right. brakes and like having the turret. Definitely, definitely. It's going to be a game changer. Um, I'm actually getting ready to put one on the boat I'm building now, <laughs> put that turret on there because... With boat control, I'm tired of, you know, coming off the fish to get the boat well, Especially when it's windy, yeah. it's annoying as hell. It yeah, really kidding. is. It really is very frustrating. Yeah. And then so. with the crappie brakes, how many more batteries are we going to need on our goddamn boat? I'm swear. <laughs> I, we're, I'm at a five bank Minn Kota charger, and now I'm like, I really wish they made a six. Yeah. It's it's insane. Like, yeah. how, how much do you guys have those on your boats? And if so, like, how much juice does that take? I do not. So I, I just got uh, bought a new to me boat a uh, week before Christmas. And so it has the power poles and it has drift paddles. So I don't oh, know if you've cool. heard of those. The, okay, have yeah. you heard of the drift paddles? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's got those on it. Doesn't have the crappy brakes, and I was being asked whether or not I want to put those on. I'm hoping I'll be happy with the drift paddles. Most of the time, I'm trying to go into the wind if I'm trying to like follow a creek channel or whatever it may be. And that way, if I'm going into the wind and I and I see a fish and I need to slow down, the wind will push me back a yeah. little bit. Now, there's been so many times I had a bass boat. Now I'm going to an aluminum boat the bass boat so heavy when I would start trolling towards a fish and it, the boat would just keep drifting and keep drifting and how many times that messed us up and run over top of a fish so I mean it, it's it's funny going down to when we went down to Grenada uh, when Ryan and I went down there there's just so many things that you see on the boat where it's like that's an advantage that's an advantage that's an advantage and then you total that cost up and it's like well what are my goals? What are my expectations? Right, right. I mean, that's, it's so funny, the cliches. Every fish commercial you see is the dumb redneck in a, in a, in a camper somewhere, but it's like, it's a $100,000 truck, it's a $100,000 bass boat. It, that is not the case anymore no, sure. to be competitive. Um, I mean, like that Icon boat, I mean, it's like $150,000. It's yeah. insane how it keeps blowing up, but it's so much fun. It really is. And I, I know you guys got a lot to do today. Thanks for coming on the show, but make sure I want you guys to plug, you know, your tournament organization and whatever booth that you're helping out in today. Um, we're helping out with dancing sport goods and they have, um, they got some of the Nick Taylor jigs over there, the ACC crappy sticks. Um, and, uh, they have been one of our, they've been our sponsor for the last couple of years. We came down to help the guys out. Um, they also sponsored the Richmond Crappy Club, which Josh started and just got it going and does an excellent job with it. So, Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll say the plug with uh, Dan Support Goods for me. I mean, there's a lot of great companies here, a lot of great rods, a lot of, a lot of great baits and everything. <clears throat> the thing I like about Dan Support Goods is, is the people that work there. When I walk in, I talk to Walter, I talk to Steve, I talk to Chase. I'm talking to the guys that I know. And um, if there's something that you want to get into and you don't know a lot about, and, like a lot of people don't know a lot about crappy fishing. If you go in there and say, hey, I'd like to try it. I think it'd be fun to take my kid. You know, what should I get? They're going to they're gonna walk you around the store and say, if I were you, I'd get this. Here's another option here. If I were you, I'd get this. Here's another option here. And they'll show you exactly what you need to do. Just customer service, fantastic. Um, you know, with that being said, too, talking about crappy fishing, I'm telling you, if you're, if you're not crappy fishing right now, you should be. You know, I think... I've got a bunch of buddies that have kids. I don't have any kids of my own, but um, when kids go fishing, you can tell like the number one deterrent for them for fishing is not having success. Amen. And a lot of these bass yep. guys, you know, if you take uh, if you take a kid fishing, it's like, hey, look, we're gonna get one bite per hour. And it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a three pounder. They might get bored pretty quick. I think yeah, your better 100%. chance is to say, hey, we're gonna go crappy fishing, and we're gonna fish for two hours, you know, and then we're gonna go do whatever, and we're gonna catch fifty fish. And we may catch one or two bass that might be three or four pounds. Now they're hooked. They're like, hey, let's right, let's try doing that. Yeah. I want to do that again. You know, yep. Jeff can speak on that topic too. Yes, today. I mean, I came up, um, I have a son who's in the thirties now, but when he came up, I about ruined him in fishing, going out smallmouth fishing. I came up smallmouth fishing. Well, I was young. And I was like, No, we're out here, we're gonna fish and when I catch he's getting bored, kinda ruined. He's come back into it now, it's great, but um, yeah, there's a there's a one that you need to the kids need to catch fish and you need to know that you're going to be on a set schedule 
It's like, you know, you're not going out to fish eight hours with a kid. You might be going out there to fish 15 minutes with a yep. kid, or you might be going out to fish two hours with a kid. So keep being able to get them on, to, yeah. get on the fish and catch some fish and leave while it's still entertaining to them. Yep. No, I 100% yeah. agree with that. Um, I mean, Jeff, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, again, uh, Richmond Crappie, uh, link in the episode, link will be in the episode description, especially on the re-upload. Again, guys, uh, the live stream will still be available. You can re-watch, unlike Monday Night Lives that I, I shut down so I can re-upload them. This will be available if you want to watch, but it'll be re-uploaded again as a podcast episode on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, I and YouTube the first week of February. And then that will that one will have all the links layered into it since today is absolutely crazy for me. Um, anything else you guys want to plug before we get out of here? Yes, I'm good. You good. Good. I, I appreciate Thank your you. podcast. Absolutely. Uh, your podcast is awesome. I've learned a lot in listening to all the, the bass fishing tips and tricks and stuff like that. I, I really appreciate you doing this. I feel like talking about a necessity, Richmond Crappy Club in the area, I feel like your podcast is a necessity well, no, for people you, to learn. Thank you so much. And then I'm definitely going to be in contact with you guys so I can get you guys in more of a, a, a good rotation. Or even if the winners want to kind of come on too, you can get me in the loop when the tournaments are so I can ask them or offer them the chance to get on as yeah, well. Because I awesome. do want to branch out to different species, not just to be bass, because there's so much in this area. I mean, hell, it's not even counting the saltwater, which is another big thing people ask me. It's such a cool area. But then, guys, like, so this is the plan. Um, we are going to take a 10 to 15 minute break. We're going to come back with our last session of the morning before we do the meet and greets. So we're going to go to a quick commercial break, and then I'll be seeing you guys a little bit later. Talk to you in about 10 minutes. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.